This is a presentation on uh, producing bathymetry from echo sounder data. Um, I thought I'd start off by showing an example of like a full like bathymetric survey uh, and the data produced by that. So this is a this is multi-beam swath of a uh, submarine canyon off the coast of uh, Baja, California. Um, it's collected by a University of Washington student uh, for a senior thesis or something like that. But uh, it shows some pretty interesting geological features there. It's collected with a, um, a Kongsberg system, uh, an EM302, I think. Um, and you can see it produces a nice, uh, nice image. The, the actual data is pretty high resolution, and uh, the feature here is, is interesting. And, uh, this is the kind of thing that requires like a, a planned ahead bathymetry surveying type of thing. It's not something you can like interpolate so from a... going out of your belly boat while you're right. right yes <laughs> although there are you know I'll show at the end of this uh, there are certainly some things you can you can pull out of uh, you know like a like a single beam type of you've got a GPS coordinate and a depth and right. you make a bathymetry set out of that like like you've mentioned but I thought I'd start off with flashy like ooh features <laughs> shiny colors so uh, um, so when you're considering uh, um, Bathymetry survey. There's three components, three main components. One is the uh, the survey gear and equipment you're using. Uh, the other is the location you'll be surveying in, and this is just a uh, more zoomed out uh, shot of uh, Baja. Um, and then also the the data that you're collecting uh, in terms of um, as you're collecting it, what you're doing with it, how you're sorting it, how you're storing it, and then after you've collected it. Uh, what sort of processing techniques you're using and uh, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, we'll kind of go through these pretty quickly. You've all, you all know, are familiar with uh, um, Echoscape and um, just simply the benefit of not bathymetry but uh, bottom tracking lets you uh, reduce the amount of uh, data you're looking at uh, live and also afterwards post-processing. Uh, you know, you get a bottom track and um, you can exclude all of that information from potential fish tracks or echo integration, that sort of thing. Um, so just bottom tracking is great. Um, but it turns out you can use this bottom tracking, even if you're just doing a uh, fisheries uh, study, to produce some sort of bathymetry um, from that data, even if it's uh, supplementary to, to your um, the specific survey you're doing. Um, so I guess I'll get into... Uh, what sort of things need to go into um, the planning stage of an actual, like, full bathymetry survey? And you've all seen this slide before. This is the uh, uh, sound velocity as a function of uh, temperature and salinity. And uh, uh, this is uh, certainly a, a bigger concern in uh, marine environments and uh, large uh, or areas where there is a pretty deep um, uh, 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 bathymetry uh, because uh, the, the acoustical properties of the, the water will compound as your, your echoing goes through the, the water column. So maybe something that you can get away with in you know, eight feet of water is not, is not going to be doable in 800 feet of water. The, the compounding um, uh, inaccuracies you'll get will throw your, your data way off and in, certainly in uh, bathymetry over uh, um, a fishery study, there's a lot more concern about um, accurately, very well pinpointing uh, a specific location on the bottom feature. So you have to take uh, this into account because the hydro, uh, the acoustic properties of, of water. And one of the reasons why you have to do that is uh, when uh, acoustic uh, pulses pass through mediums with different uh, uh, reflective in, refractive indexes, indexes, which uh, can be uh, altered by, again, we saw the speed of sound graph there, uh, uh, salinity or temperature, uh, pressure. Um, your acoustic wave will actually uh, change direction as it passes through the medium. And uh, so this isn't very concerning when you're using uh, a, a single pulse that's shooting straight down and uh, um, just vertically moving through uh, uh, perpendicular layers of uh, different uh, uh, 
uh, a medium, but when you have systems like multi-beams or um, side scans that uh, send out a swath, or when you have systems that uh, have angled uh, echo sounders, this, uh, this effect of refracting through the medium is, can be a pretty big, um, Im can have a pretty big impact on, on the data you're collecting. Um, and this kind of relates to the, the dead zone at the bottom of, uh, near the, the bottom of a um, insonified area, not being able to resolve that because uh, a specific, like the center location of your insonified area would return before the outer edges of your insonified area, Mac, uh, uh, masking any fish or anything like that in there. In the same way, if you have a, a fan of um, bottom detecting uh, acoustical uh, uh, equipment, uh, this refracting as your angle uh, off of vertical becomes higher and higher uh, is a greater and greater effect. And uh, it's described here by Snell's law where you've got your um, refractive index of the, the, the medium, which is a function of temperature and salinity and all that sort of thing in, in water. And uh, you can see that it's also dependent on angle. So the 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 high, the more oblique the angle is, the um, increased effect of this uh, ray bending, as it's called, uh, happens. And uh, what occurs is you're you're surveying, and your uh, survey vessel is traveling down your transect line. And uh, because ref, ref, um, ray bending doesn't occur uh, in the center of the the swath, you get some depth and some feature. But as it increases, as the ray bending increases, your your timing calculations become more and more off because the um, sonar will assume that the the ray is actually the uh, incoming acoustic pulse is coming from some angle, but it's really bending through the water instead of coming straight from where it's been received, and then uh, your range is altered, and therefore your timing is altered, and what you end up getting is a symmetry that looks like it's smiling or frowning so you know I used to run on a um, survey vessels all the time and you never wanted uh, happy data you didn't want sad or happy data because then, then it meant you were introducing artifacts into your into your uh, into your bathymetry yes yeah, so uh, the the way that you account for this is um, again I mentioned in the um, in my first I guess rather dull um, <laughs> PowerPoint about just basic acoustical properties. Um, I mentioned that uh, the importance of knowing the speed of sound in the water was uh, vital because of timing and, and things of that nature. Well, because of this ray bending, this is another reason why this is so important. And to take account of that, um, you do um, uh, you use uh, sound velocity profilers that you would just drop an instrument over the side of your survey vessel that um, takes measurements of the speed of sound. Some of them take them directly, um, others just measure uh, temperature, salinity, pressure, that sort of thing, and you drop the device all the way to the seafloor and then bring it back up, which breaks your, um, uh, uh, your surveying time, but it's, it's necessary, and then you get a model of the speed of sound as a function of the water column, and you input this into your uh, collection software or you, you post-process this afterwards and it produces, you, you um, get estimates of if uh, uh, an incoming beam is at this angle, then that means it will have ray traced all the way down to here, depending on what your um, speed of sound profile is. So there is corrections built directly into um, different uh, commercial uh, bathymetry survey gear in the hardware side and in the software side. So this is one of the concerns you have to be uh, mindful of. Um, and then another for uh, bathymetric surveying is, um, I know it's not uh, a huge concern in isolated areas like lakes and uh, rivers and things like that. Or, um, but it, it, certainly in a marine environment, you have tidal effects, which need to be taken into account if you're trying to relate uh, bathymetry to uh, other known locations, other uh, monuments that have been surveyed, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, either post-processed, uh, you can get, uh, this is, these plots are uh, tidal data from uh, NOAA's uh, Tides and Currents uh, website, and they'll give, they have a bunch of uh, um, 
uh, tidal uh, gauges all over the country that will they produce live data for and then they produce predicted data for and then a few weeks later they'll have uh, verified data for and you can use this to find accurate uh, uh, depths and, uh, or more specifically heights of your survey vessel compared to your uh, GPS uh, measurements and these two plots the top one is um, the uh, Seattle um, uh, um, a buoy that they have there and uh, you can see there's a clear I mean that's a there's 10 meter swings in I think that's in meters uh, it's just pulled directly off their website there's a there's a big uh, um, shift in, in tides this is in a like a two-day period I think um, for mean low low water um, and the bottom one is uh, um, the Rochester New York one uh, um, on the Great Lake there and while there isn't a huge like diurnal tide going on there's still certainly um, minor fluctuations that can be accounted for when you're um, relating your uh, relative depth measurement to a uh, real world depth um, to relate to a, a, you know a known projection that sort of thing um, so this is the kind of thing that if you're surveying for uh, more than a very short period of time your data will swing and you might do like a cross transect to verify that your the depths you got were the depths you then get you know you 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 collect data twice to make sure you've, you've you haven't messed up in some way but the tide will cause the depth that you have to to vary greatly so this is a thing that needs to be uh, taken into account um, when you're uh, surveying and this might also have bearing on protected areas like uh, dams or reservoirs or things when there's uh, you know years of uh, high ice melt or something or you know what the dam operating um, uh, the, the the volume of the, the the pool is at the time and certainly the NOAA doesn't um, have beacons for that sort of thing but there there there's there's data you can collect from um, different sources on that sort of thing um, and then another uh, thing about the environment you have to be concerned about is uh, your um, how you're referencing your uh, positional data um, and this is I mean people have done spent their whole lives working on this sort of work and it's a lot of it is above me so I'll you know just basically say that um, you know when you're talking about latitude and longitude that's latitude and longitude in a certain system um, for GPS that's uh, uh, WGS 84 currently um, and that's just a, um, a chosen system to map the shape of the earth to a spheroid or an ellipsoid actually um, because the surface of the earth is not um, easily mathematically modeled um, it's a very complicated surface uh, the the geoid it's called it's actually the um, the surface of equipotential um, gravity field over the surface of the earth and you can think of it as where water would settle on the earth what the water level is if there was no tide if the, the moon wasn't existent or um, there wasn't any land masses that sort of thing and uh, so you have to choose a, 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 an ellipsoid to, to use and that's your lat longs from your your GPS receiver and then another thing you also have to be concerned about is when you're um, you know when you have this data and you want to present it to a client or whatnot or you want to view it in any way, you're likely viewing it uh, a, a, an ellipsoidal data set onto a two-dimensional plane. So you need to somehow project that information you've collected onto a flat plane, and that can depend on your location, what um, particular projections have the least amount of distortion in them, depending on where you are. Um, a common one to use in North America is a uh, uh, UTM, Universal Transverse Mercator Coordinate System, something like that. And it's actually a group of uh, projections, not one projection. I think it's like 60 um, uh, projections going around the world, um, or something close to that. I forget the exact amount, but there's a there's a north set and a south hemisphere set, and um, that's good for. I think the the military developed that a, a while ago. Um, there's also you know local projections. I know where I was from, um, we often worked, when we did oil and gas work, uh, we often worked in Louisiana South, which is some backwater uh, 
the oil and gas industry there had been there for 50 years and no one wanted to convert to metric or use a more standard uh, projection. So we were working in like feet and this wacky like conical projection system that had weird distortions and weird areas that you had to take into account. So this is extremely complicated and, and, uh, and uh, it's something that needs to be considered when you, you're trying to figure out how you want, what your, what your data requirements are, who needs to see this, how you want to relate like what other sources of information you want to combine with your bathymetry, say like fish tracking, uh, and what what sort of um, data you already have can then be related to your data if you've selected a, a proper projection. Um, so those are some of the things you need to be concerned about with uh, in terms of um, the environment, the survey location you're 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 surveying. Any, any software that you like for converting? Lat longs to UTMs or? Um, well, so the we conversion between lat long and UTM is uh, formulaic. It's an extremely complicated right, formula it's like with four like pages. with with a crazy amount. Um, I have in the past used, uh, I mean, just basically Excel. You if you can set it up to work like that. You just put in your uh, lat longs and you have like your minor radius and your major radius and all your factors in there and your four page long equation but there's also standalone programs that are specifically just designed for um, conversion of just like the, the entirety of the program can be described in just this realm of study um, I've been using one on the University of Texas online well, I, yeah, so you can go online and just pick match. up like an Excel thing, but there's also like programs like... Um, It'd just be nice for batch I forget the you name. Right, right, right. I, I've got an Excel sheet I can send you that does batch both directions. You choose which datum yeah. you want. There's also, um, I think it's called like Geocoder or like yeah, Starcoder or something like that. That are like, and their, their only function is to take data sets and you tell it what projection or what... Uh, ellipsoid you're using and it'll just convert from one to the other and you say this is the file I have give me a new file in this format it's a star coder ah, I, f I can get I can find the names of it for you it's been a while since I've used those but I've also just used like you know uh, programming that language to use your um, instead of just spitting numbers in Excel just like writing a script in MATLAB to quickly pull a file run it I'll put a file that sort of thing just with the Long oh, to equation. run the standalone. Right. Or no, just to run, like, do it in the programming language, MATLAB or, you yeah, know, see, Python or whatever, whatever you want. It's getting online. <laughs> four pages. It's, like, God, it's, it's, it's that, super, yeah. super complicated. There are there are standalone programs. I can try and yeah, figure out okay, what those are. I mean, it may be a data, but I used to use ProLat, P-R-O-L-A-T. I definitely, I mean, like, in... Um, my uh, the place I was actually doing bathymetric surveys we used uh, uh, to collect our side scan data we used uh, SonarWiz, which I mean all these names that I'm I'm giving you are probably expensive software. This is specifically for collecting and processing side scan data, but one of its functions is converting between one ellipsoid, one projection to another. Sort of thing. So I there, figured there's got to be. Some there are dedicated there. programs. There's got to be an app for it. Right. Yeah. So yes. I was going to say there, that one I use is I believe you can read in CSV files to it. You have your lat long, right. and then it'll spit them out of CSV yeah. files and the conversion. So. That'd be great. I think it's University of Texas or something. Okay. I can't remember where I saw that. I, I need to go back and I wrote, I've written it down in my file for hard to use this. Yeah. So the, yeah, well, I just don't use it enough to justify spending right a purchase. Right. Yeah. yeah. I know, and it <laughs> took us a while. But, uh, <laughs> they finally, <laughs> they finally came. They're, they're using the UTMs now. Yeah, but the problem is, it's just the files that come out of, out of Echoscape. So the the raw the, the files that are tracked in real time coming on your sounder still are just lat longs. Lat longs, right? So you have to convert the files from FSH and, or actually DOT files, DOT. To, right. to right into Echoscape and spit them out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Well, and it just came up with this new sound I've got that oh, right. really spits out in lat longs. I hate lat longs. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that was uh, some of the um, environmental understandings you need to have before performing this sort of survey. And you also have to take into account, um, uh, based on the environment, uh, what sort of equipment you'll be using. Um, uh, and here's just a goofy slide of pictures of some equipment things. Um, uh, so one of the main things is when you're using a when you're performing a survey on a mobile platform, um, and you need the precision required for bathymetry, um, and there's varying levels of, of standard precisions for that. Uh, you need to have a, an offset uh, diagram for what your positional data is compared to where your transducers are, compared to where your uh, uh, motion sensors are, compared to where all your senses are, so that it's not some um, uh, uh, stepwise thing, everything isn't broken up and um, its own entity. Everything can be related to one point because sometimes the requirements of the survey are you've got a, a transducer that's 14 meters across and that requires a, a significant sized boat and the separation between your transducer and your GPS antenna is meters and meters and meters and uh, that'll, if you're simply bringing in raw uh, GPS coordinates to relate how you're getting your depths uh, you're not taking into account like the water level as it uh, uh, the the draft of the boat that sort of thing. Uh, you you can introduce significant uh, error into your into your depth measurements and your uh, bottom tracking. Um, so you need to have a, a pretty good surveyed uh, understanding of how all of your uh, instruments relate to each other spatially, and uh, you also uh, need to take into account the uh, boats motion on the water and how the boat sits in the water uh, measuring you know taking draft readings as the fuel of the boat is consumed as you're as you're taking the as you're uh, performing the survey and how the the boat uh, how the draft of the boat changes as you're um, performing different survey speeds um, how the transducer points in different directions as you're rolling in waves that sort of thing um, so you need to have a pretty good understanding of your, your vessel and uh, where everything is on your vessel and how to relate that so you can properly offset that. Um, another thing you need to uh, take into account is uh, different survey areas have different requirements for uh, what sort of um, acoustics you need to use. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, higher frequency uh, acoustics tend to be absorbed uh, faster than uh, or in, with less range than than lower frequency acoustics. So if you're if you really need high precision and you're in shallow water, you might want a high frequency uh, echo sounder of some sort. This is a spec sheet for an EM302, which is a Kongsberg device. This is what was used to collect the uh, first page that you saw, um, and it's a 30 kilohertz system. Um, but if you're if you're looking in really low uh, really deep uh, areas and you, your um, resolution isn't as important as your uh, ability to range to that, uh, to that particular depth, you might, you, you might need to consider uh, lower frequencies. Uh, you know, things like your paint, the ping rate of your, uh, of your echo sounder, the, uh, the pulse formation, um, uh, depending on what uh, you need in terms of accuracies, how fast you need to run your boat based on your uh, swath width, um, so you're getting like a certain amount of insonified areas per unit area or whatever the um, survey specifications are. So you you, re you need you, you need the right equipment for the job when you're doing um, bathymetry survey. But really, as I'll show as in an example here later, you can you can take what is essentially single beam data and having a point of um, a, a single point of depth per every time you have a, a GPS coordinate for your vessel and convert that into some basic uh, bathymetry. Um, another thing you need to con be concerned about in terms of equipment is your positioning system. Um, so uh, like I mentioned before about the, the vessel offset, you certainly need to understand how your um, uh, GPS antenna position is related to everything else on your um, vessel, but 
there's also uh, uncertainty built into the uh, the GPS system in general. And um, when you're when you're actually getting a GPS signal, it's uh, a timing uh, it's a timing related measurement from satellites in the sky. And uh, there's some error in that timing. And you can see the the left diagram with the red and blue dot um, with the uh, uh, overlapping curves, red and blue. Um, if there was no uncertainty in measurement, then you're doing, you know, this This is a, a 2D example. Um, you could say you were either, let me put my mouse up here since I don't know where the laser pointer is. You could say you're either here or if this is a full circle here. And then in three dimensions, you can um, simplify that because, you know, It'll actually take three satellites and I think a fourth for timing, but one of your points will be on the surface of the Earth and one of them will be you know, somewhere near the moon and you can probably take that out and that's what your uh, GPS unit does. But there's uncertainty in that measurement, so what really happens is you get an area of probability that you are in this location with some Gaussian uh, distribution of, three-dimensional Gaussian distribution of where you actually are. Um, and that area, can change depending on the geometry. In this case, these two uh, dots would be represent the satellites in the sky. And if they are in a particular geometry that is acceptable, you've minimized your um, uh, uncertainty area. But if they have a particular geometry where their um, the range to them has a high area of overlap, you can see that um, the range, so if this is some function like 90% confidence interval if you're in this location. You can see the overlap of the confidence interval gives you this, but if this just changing the satellites around, not the range or anything like that, the uh, overlapping areas become much larger. Um, and this is what's called dilution of precision, and it's simply a, a function of where the satellites are in the sky. And uh, there's pretty good information on how that is uh, how your uh, dilution of precision behaves based on time of day uh, and satellite position in the sky and your location. So areas with high need for constant uh, uh, survey work like uh, the Gulf of Mexico where the oil and gas industry is big and that sort of thing have um, satellite geometries where this isn't really uh, um, a, a problem most of the time but you can get uh, up near the poles, if you're doing surveying in Alaska, that sort of thing, uh, your dilution of precision can get pretty high during certain times of day, and so this restricts when and where you're able to survey. So you might only have like a few hours in chunks during a day to actually do your survey. So that's another um, complication that that you need to consider. Yeah, so a GPS's output will give you, um, based on its detection of satellite geometry, how many satellites it's detecting, uh, that sort of thing. It will, um, I'm not sure if it's part of the NMEA string, I think it is, um, but as its output, most GPS's will give you uh, an H dop, which is a horizontal vertical position, uh, dilution of precision, V dop, which is vertical, P dop, which is total geometrical. Uh, I think there's also T dop, which I'm little fuzzy on, but it, uh, a satellite receiver will give you this information and um, it affects your accuracies of where you are and therefore what your bathymetry is. And, uh, and uh, that's just something that needs to be taken into account as you're, as you're surveying. Um, so then you, you've, uh, you've planned your survey accordingly and you've, um, you've gone and you've surveyed and you've taken some of these into account and also other factors. Uh, and then what you're dealing with is uh, is your data afterwards. So, um, no matter how good you are, there's always going to be some artifacts in your data, some outliers in your data. Um, depending on what system you're using, there might be more noise. What you know, what frequency you're using may introduce noise. What pulse characteristics may introduce noise. Some sort of. There's a lot of. Uh, uh, probability that you'll be you'll be needing to clean this data afterwards. So, um, one of the first steps, early steps in producing bathymetry like this, is uh, cleaning data. Um, you'll also then, uh, as I alluded to in the vessel diagram, you'll need to relate. You know, if you're running a a, a multi-beam system and a single beam system and a side scan system and a, a GPS all at the same time, 
they then need to be combined in a way that makes sense so you know that the you know the the one of your echo sounders is 10 feet four of and uh, uh two feet more towards stern uh, more towards uh, the um port than another uh, you need to be able to relate them in some way in order to get bathymetry that uh, doesn't conflict with itself. Um, so you then need to combine the data. Um, and then you need to con um, be mindful of what your final product is and, and how useful that is to you or your client or whoever is going to use this. So um, here is an example of contours. Um, you can also have uh, GIS integrated uh, data where it has positional uh, data related right to it. Um, so you can open that in uh, GIS and quickly uh, slap that on top of uh, uh, local topography or other GIS data you have, uh, uh, you know, fish tracking, that sort of thing, hydrophone arrays, that sort of thing. Um, and so you need to take that into account. And uh, this is useful for, you know, knowing the bathymetry of the, of the, the local bathymetry of an area is as useful for fish behavior, um, you know, what, uh, you know, you might uh, predict uh, uh, predators hang out in some area based on bathymetry, you might um, predict the flow of, uh, of a fish based on bathymetry. Um, it's useful in that regard. It's also useful if you're installing um, not mobile uh, surveys, but stationary surveys, hydrophone placement, um, let you see things like where uh, you'll get no line of sight for a certain area. You can model that based on uh, where you want to put hydrophones. You can see certain areas that you would expect to have more, um, uh, uh, more uh, echoing off of uh, nearby surfaces and there's a word for that, but I've totally forgotten it. Um, you can model the acoustical properties of the uh, the area you're in. Uh, say some areas uh, might um, might have spherical spreading associated with them, and others, maybe shallower areas, will have um, uh, cylindrical spreading, that sort of thing. So there's, there's plenty of use for that, and those are just some examples that I could think of. Um, Yeah, no, when, it, when I was, when, when you're trying to create bathymetry, fish are an annoyance and they cause you time and uh, therefore money because they've blocked uh, areas that would normally be insonified. And, you know, some of the frequencies were you, we were using with like a side scan sonar uh, overlap with frequency use that, uh, that dolphins use to communicate. So we would get, you know, entire hours of towing a side scan and dolphins trying to make out with it the whole time and you would just get big giant swaths of nothing because it would all be returning within like a few centimeters of your of your toe fish and I mean I I'm certainly too young for this but I've heard stories of, of guys on boats getting so so angry with this that they throw over fireworks or something like that to <laughs> scare them off but that's uh bathymetry is useful for for uh for comparing to to fisheries but sometimes we can get kind of annoyed with the fish there <laughs> um but uh so here is a uh so so that was running a, a bathymetric survey um here's uh, an example of um data collected with an hdi uh split beam and this is an echoscape and uh as i mentioned just the usefulness of uh having a bottom track for lower computational um uh, times uh for uh, echo integration, and you, you're you're not uh, using as the entire insonified area, and and that sort of thing um, is useful for bathymetry. And uh, I think I zoomed in on here in case it was too dark, but you know you can see schools of fish and individual fish here, and your bottom track will allow you to ignore anything below that, that sort of thing. But of course, it's also collected, and uh, um, you can refine it post. Post-processing, uh, this is post-processed. Uh, you can see the, the, the bottom track line there, and then you can just export that data as a uh, depth. And this uh, this is a culled down version of what's exported in Echoscape, but um, all this data is there when you save it in, in, the, in the bottom tracking. And 
uh, it gives you a, a latitude and a longitude or a UTM projection um, and your depth and uh, you can easily take this information and and export it into um, some other program to create uh, bathymetry and I've got two examples here of uh, the same data set processed in two, two programs so this is this is just MATLAB very very quick very it was like 30 something lines of code most of it was formatting this picture and the, like a line of code dedicated to the title of Rupert Quebec Canada um, this is a survey that HDI did in Rupert River uh, in Quebec Canada and uh, certainly bathymetry was not part of the survey specifications but it's easily enough to, to be pulled out and uh, the, the background image is, is just uh, uh, some uh, uh, section of Google Maps API you can have different you, um, there's you can uh, import uh, different photographs or other sources of topography for your local area maybe you have like blueprints or specifications of something of a dam or you might have uh, topography of uh, the area around a river that sort of thing but it's easy enough to create something like this and I've got um, uh, this is just based on the transects that they they ran and only pulling out the, the bottom data um, things like the vessel diagram weren't taken into uh, account here and things like tides weren't taken into account here as they're they're pretty negligible and but in terms of just a basic uh, bathymetric set of the area, it, it can be pretty robust. Um, and so you start with, like I said, so this, this uh, particular survey was three sections. I've shown two here. There's another uh, further upriver, which is uh, to the uh, east, um, the third section. This is the first two. Um, and you start with, this is the third section of the, air, of the survey, and these are just the, the uh, transects that were run. Um, and they've got an associated depth with them because of your your, your post-processed, refined, uh, you know, very quickly in the in the bottom tracking editing, uh, you can make uh, all this data. And uh, in MATLAB, that just uh, gets converted into a, an interpolated surface uh, that you can use to either uh, represent your bathymetry as is. Um, or convert to some sort of contour, both very simple. Um, so in MATLAB, how are you interpolating? Uh, so in MATLAB, so I've got the, the code here just to show how short it was, but the actual interpolation happened in right here. And this is just creating a, a regular grid of the area, so it's actually a um, 50 by 50 binned um, section that has associated uh, latitudes in one axis, longitudes the other, and then a depth. And then uh, converting that from the um, uh, the raw lat long depth here to uh, gridded data, which is just its own um, so uh, interpolation fiction. I think it's a, a linear fit between points and it has a few different options. Here it's omitted and I think it defaults to linearly interpolating between uh, thin datas, but you can also have like cubic or spline, uh, something like that, yes. But just for the, a, a quick presentation here, I've just got the, the gridded data there. And, and then once you have whatever you want, you can layer it by importing an image or, or not do, you know, this uh, uh, topography from Google Maps is just as easily imported as you know fish track lines that sort of thing and all this data can be rendered three-dimensionally as well so you can have uh, create videos of of panning around uh, objects or other detections your fish detections that sort of thing and uh, it's you know in terms of how complicated it is 38 lines all of this is just to make a figure to show uh, in terms of getting your contours you know that's contours this is interpolation all of this information is just uh, import the data and then split it up this section right here is I didn't want a contour between all of these three separate areas that were pretty far apart so it's a it's pretty simple to do in uh, in MATLAB this actually isn't MATLAB this is um, 
uh, new freeware GNU. I don't know how that's pronounced. Freeware version of Octave, um, but it's it's the same. It's uh, identical coding. Um, and then also, you know, another one of the many ways to get uh, um, bathymetry out of your uh, um, your data is uh, in ArcGIS. And we had a guy, our resident ArcGIS expert, that just got his master's in GIS. I emailed this to him, and 30 minutes later, he said, "Okay, here's here's uh, some some results." And it's essentially the same concept. You have your track lines, known locations of depths, and then because it, you're, you know, in a in fisheries aspect, you're not running bathymetry. There's going to be um, interpolation. You're going to have to. Uh, you're going to have to accept that unless you want to really tighten up your transects. But with interpolation, uh, you you defined an area with, with a uh, a polygon in the program, uh, told it to grid the data from that gridded data he's um, converted into a contour map here he's gone contour maps of, of half meter intervals I'm sure that's uh, way too tight as, as Travis would, would tell us but um, you know it can be done at, at varying levels of, um, of uh, uncertainty to the actual uh, measure of the, the contour that sort of thing and he wrote up a quick um, how to is basically in and out, just like the, the MATLAB program. Uh, you start with your your uh, your X Y Z data. Uh, you create an area that you want to make contours. Um, he's got a topography to raster tool and an ArcMap 2D or an ArcScene 3D um, tool in ArcGIS. Uh, you tell it to, to interpolate to your um, your raster image, uh, and then you. Uh, remove all of the excess data outside of the area you've defined and then create a contour out of that interpolated binned, uh, bin data and that's a that's a quick quick and dirty but can sometimes be uh, pretty accurate um, certainly you know 30 years ago bathymetry surveys were uh, guys standing on the back of dinghies in the swamps of Louisiana and poking the, the bottom of the stick and, and measuring where it's taped off on the stick every 20 or so feet. So um, that certainly doesn't stand up to uh, current, uh, you know, modern, you know, multi-thousand dollar, uh, multi-beam systems, but it can get you uh, bathymetry pretty quickly, pretty readily, and you all probably already have all of this data to, to quickly spit out bathymetry. So. And uh, that was uh, that was all I have to say about that. Oh uh, yeah, it's just a raster-based GIS, and um, you know we're just looking to figure out how much road mode we need. So sure. the stick with the tape works too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> um, we're good with that. But, uh, and certainly some of this stuff can be, like all the nonsense I went over about what goes into planning a bathymetric survey, maybe it'd be an okay idea to at some point relate your, your GPS antenna to your transducer location on your, on your survey vessel, and then you can know you have that much more accurate bathymetry that you're creating, right. Right. things like that. So I, I did that correction. I didn't go as a measure draft under normal conditions. I mm -hmm. didn't adjust for varying fuel loads. Fuel consumption. Yeah, yeah, no, it's <laughs> on, on larger vessels, that's pretty significant. So if I'm that can... out of my belly boat, I have to factor in whether I had lunch. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How, how With, many cases of beer? <laughs> some of the smaller vessels I've worked on, the, the, uh, the um, motion reference unit that we use is affected by, you know, whether you sat on this side of the cabin or that side of the cabin in the morning right. when it was calibrating. So. So there's a lot of a lot of stuff to take into account when you're producing information like this. We actually adjust for that too when we're adjusting the side looking transducer is where people are gonna mm -hmm. sit so for the majority right. of the transaction. Yeah. Right. On small boats. Yeah. yeah. Technicians are always like, Am I allowed to get out of the chair? Like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Sixteen hours. You're right. staying quiet. And you know, like the squat of the boat as you're surveying at different speeds, you were mentioning um, I've I've put people to sleep, but uh, Scott was mentioning that 
trying to get bottom tracking on high sloping areas, you would you would decelerate to uh, try and get that uh, get that in, and that affects the the orientation of your your survey equipment because you're now drafting at a different angle. So it's a lot of goofy stuff that you need to take into account. For those contract surveys. Oh, it's it's quite variable. Like, um, so it goes from like uh, NOAA contracts out different firms to do site clearance for like shipping lanes, and that just the only thing they're really concerned about. They like the bathymetry, but are really only concerned about least depths on targets, that sort of thing. And then it all gets all the way down to a uh, hurricane has passed by, and you need to survey. Um, uh, like uh, Exxon wants you to survey one of its wells with a pipeline and see how much the the pipeline has shifted, um, and because they need to keep keep uh, yeah no they they, they can shift significantly um, to to stay in regulation of them having to report where their pipelines are and that sort of thing and uh, marine construction jobs where uh, the firm uh, that's going to build a, a platform need to know pretty precisely where. Uh, where their their stuff is going to sit, so it's it varies pretty wildly. Yeah, no, it was the one image you had so it was the earlier example with the dam that was on spun together recently for one of the acoustic peg basically study design for a this is boundary dam right before the Canadian middle of the border but uh, they wanted to put in what it will be doing some of this work. It was really useful. 